Good morning and let me welcome you to Adelaide Place. We're delighted you're with us. My name is Neil and I serve as students intern here. As we start, I wonder if you join me in pausing to remind ourselves of the God who is the reason that we gather. God who is holy, set apart and yet meets us. God who speaks The God who is constant, who is love, who is Father, Son and Spirit. As we gather, shall we read these words of Psalm 24 together? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down I sing for all that 
of your great love for us. We praise you this morning. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the
Welcome again. It's been so great having people join us online from all over during this time. If you want to get in touch, you can do that through our website. It's a great place to learn more about our church and find various ways that you can participate in what God is doing here. Over the next couple of minutes, why don't you take the opportunity to send a message to a friend or a neighbour or someone from our church who you want to encourage or even just say hi to before our scripture is read and then Stephen, our lead pastor, comes and speaks to us. got questions why am i here what's the point what difference does my life make Thank you. why do things that are so bad for us taste so good hey siri, siri do, you do you pray, pray? i don't have an answer for that how can i live life to the full what can i really trust what's my purpose what do you think happens when you die you're going straight to the gulags does anyone hear my prayer What's for dinner? What will make me happy? Why don't good things last forever? What is God really like? Has anyone else even asked himself these questions? Hey everyone, I've got an amazing Alpha Online group here. A better place to ask life's big questions. Ask Alpha. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established for that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will they teach their neighbours or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this new covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of people who had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Well, hello. So 24 verses spread across three chapters. Some ideas more easily accessible than others. But I think it's important to get an overall sense of the flow of this section of Hebrews, as it tells us something significant about how through Jesus we are to access God. This is a game changer moment for the, the writer to the Hebrews. You know what a game changer moment is? I, I have them all the time. I think it's because I, I work with a bunch of people who are a lot more tech savvy than me. And it, it's just moments like when they're, they show me a, a short command of how to use my laptop quicker, better, or how to move files from one thing to the next differently. And I always try my best to try and kind of give the impression I kind of knew that and then inwardly, secretly go away and change absolutely everything. Well, th- this is a pivotal moment. This is a, a change moment. in in the book of Hebrews, change in terms of the terms of how, through Jesus, we are to access God. Pretend, if you like, it's not significant, but for the person who who is convinced that they want to know something more of their passion or their first love for God, or somebody who just wants to know, is there a God? Or the person who's already convinced that intimacy is a real thing. It's not just for the elite, but it's something that you can experience. It's something you have experienced. It's something that you you, you want it back, then this is a significant moment to listen to. But first of all, we need to go to and, and try and understand the strange world of the ancient Hebrew and their mindset and approach to the presence of God. Now, this small nation, this small group of people were, were known for their radical monotheism. The idea that the one true living God was present among them, this rather unimpressive people. So three things about the the presence of God in the Hebrew mind. Firstly, God's presence was a powerful reality. They just needed to think back to the great liberation of how God's presence swept their enemies away without them hardly lifting a finger. Or indeed the, the pillar of cloud that marked God's presence and led them through the desert. 
by day and the pillar of fire that led them by night and would descend both on the, the tent of meeting, this tabernacle that was described in chapter 9 and all its mysterious glory that God would meet with them really um, visibly before the people. And so they had, they, were, they had all conviction that God's presence was a powerful reality. But God's presence was also a personal reality. Often the phrase pops up when God is renewing his, his covenant or beginning his covenant. He'll say, I will be their God and they will be my people. It speaks of a God who wants to care for, cherish, to know, to walk with. Harkens back to almost the, the, the Garden of Eden of God walking with Adam and Eve. Such was the relationality of this God. And of course, the Hebrew people know their great leader Moses through the desert went to this special tent of meeting and he would meet with God and any Hebrew could finish this line, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. Friendship with God, Moses had, he seen something, he would come back glowing with the presence of God. Such was his, his closeness with his experience of God. God's presence was a relational reality. But God's presence was, was also a mediated reality. And this is where in chapter 9, it gives this incredible description of this earthly tabernacle, this construction, this way of modelling, a way of mediating God's presence, of approaching him with, a, with an outer court and then this most holy place with all the strange instruments that go around it. And this most holy place, it could be, it's, the Hebrew for that is just holy of holies. It reflects the temple as well that was later constructed. So the tabernacle and the temple, by their very structure, had this idea of this outer courts where the Gentiles, non-Jews, women and children would meet. Then um, an inner section where men would be allowed, devout Jewish men. And then this most holy place with the holy of holies, just behind this thick curtain where once a year the high priest would go to offer a sacrifice, always with a sacrifice, for his sins and the sins of the people. There was no sense in their mindset that you could just approach this God without the mediation, without an awareness of your, your own dis, uh, sin or disconnection from this God and weakness. And so God's presence was a powerful reality, it was a personal reality, but it was also a mediated reality. And this was the story they lived by. There were other stories that were around in the ancient Mesopotamia, other capricious gods of Egypt, just like there are other stories that people live by today. Other versions of belief in God, belief in God like therapeutic deism, the idea that God is there for our benefit, he just wants to make us feel better about ourselves. And deism, you know, this idea that God, there is a creator God, perhaps a way removed. He, it's like the analogy is given of a clock that's been wound up and started and then left just to tick along to its own devices. And there's other versions of unbelief in God. Some call it exclusive rationality. The idea that truth is only that which there is significant evidence for or that which we can be empirically uh, proved in some sort of scientific way. Interesting to explore that mindset because the proposition that sets itself that sets up of needing empirical evidence cannot that proposition cannot even stand up to the weight of its own argument. But that aside, the story of the ancient Hebrews they lived by was of this God, this living God who was transcendent. He was over all things, but he was also eminent, involved in their sustaining of their life, and and knowable and reachable. This was what it meant when they, they talked of the presence of God. However, even their system, temple and law, tabernacle and all its glory, it was incomplete. And the writer to the Hebrews knew that. For sure, the law w w was helpful for a time. It, it restrained evil. It showed something that was quite a progressive system, for, particularly for the sort of barbaric culture of its time. It led them though, like a guardian led them forward. It showed them that they couldn't save themselves. It showed them the mixed upness of their, of their own lives and their own hearts that they couldn't sort themselves out. But it, it, it was leading them forward with this whole mystery that God would bend himself to the human consciousness of time, revealing himself to particular people, particular places and times and all of the mystery that cannot be explained away. 
But it is interesting that the early Christians, when they continued to worship in the temple, of course, up until AD 70 in Jerusalem, when the temple was destroyed. Fascinating that they didn't seek at all to rebuild it. They carried on. They just worshipped in homes. Because they knew that the, the building, God's presence was not tied to a building. God's presence was not tied to a place or a law. God's presence was now freely given and opened up through this new way, the real way. Everything that had before, it was like a copy. It was a shadow. It's like what Subitio is to football, if that means anything to anybody. Or what virtual church is to actual, real, physical church. It's not the real thing. And the real thing has been opened up by this new way through Jesus Christ. A new way. And not just nice and neat and easier and tighter without all that sacrifice stuff. Nothing easy about the way that led Christ to the cross. But it is a better way. Better for the writer to the Hebrews in terms of it being a wider, a deeper and a more lasting work and a way of opening up our relationship to God. Wider in the sense that it says it's from the least of them to the greatest. This would be a wider work. Not just Moses, you know, the only one who can get friendly with God and see him face to face. But from the least to the greatest, which is speaking of this move, no longer of the spirit, no longer people from which background you're from, which home you're brought up into, but all peoples from all nations, simply being able to access God through simple faith in Jesus. No privilege, nothing can, can get you ahead, but only coming in simple faith. This is a wider work. But there's a deeper work, because of course 7, chapter 11 says, if perfection could have attained, been attained through the Levitical priest and law, then we would have seen that. But it hadn't. It failed. It, there's something that remained external about laws written down in tabs of stone. You have to do this and that. And this new work would be a deeper work, where I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. This was a sign that this new age had come, this deeper work of the eternal spirit changing people from the inside out. But it'd also be a lasting work. This um, victory through the blood of Christ was, would save people from the acts that led to death and lead them to, to be able to serve the living God. No longer would this um, death reign, but it would, the life before the living God would reign, this eternal life that begins here and now where the old is, is done away, this new age has come, a glory that doesn't just glow for a while and then fade, but a glory that goes um, from glory to glory and continues on, the lasting, the wider, deeping, lasting, better way of Jesus. And this 12 foot square room or 15 foot square room, whatever it was, is opened up to all. This curtain is torn in two and the presence of God we are invited to come into through Jesus. I, I was just trying to get my head a little more around that as I paced around my, I don't know, 15 foot square study, something like that. And just that physical space, saying that there's, there's nothing for the person who comes through Jesus that, that can stop, no lockdown, no, no, nothing can stop us accessing God as our place of, like an anchor as it's described in chapter 6, a place of security, a place of stability, a place where we can come unguarded and speak and know God as friend. Over the last number of years, moving from Aberdeen to Glasgow, I've, I've made lots of new friends and I was thinking about that to try and just regulate and, and imagine what, what life with God really looks like as friend and there's one friendship in particular has been uh, re really precious over the last uh, number of years and I remember a moment where we started to get to know this guy a, a lot um, better and closer we were away a bunch of families and staying in this sort of idyllic place where he, where he grew up and um, one moment we were by the sea and we went round the beach to a little tiny chapel and um, he obviously wanted to take me there and he, he just started telling me some stories that, and a moment in particular where he came to this little chapel after, let's just say some things in life had gone a little, uh, not quite the right way. And it just he was telling me about this moment of trying to just come back to, to um, and realize some of the mistakes he'd made in that place. And we laughed and we just thought about all the things we've done in life that can be a bit like that. And it was a real moment just in this tiny, tiny chapel, only probably room for three or four people to, to stand. And in this idyllic setting, and it, it was just such a place of intimacy with this friendship. 
and that this continues and um, it has, has a sense of security to it. But every time I see this guy and see him off around neighborhood, it's not it's not like super intimate all the time. It has loads of different modes and experiences. And I say all that because I think there's something about friendship with God that we can in some way totally overestimate what it looks like and completely underestimate. Overestimate in the sense that it feels like friendship with God feels like, you know, it should be ecstatic and like a miracle a day and just outstanding every day. And if we go through seasons where it's difficult, then oh, we'll just throw it all out. And it can be just quite a, an unhealthy expectation that we go through our whole life, always kind of chasing the wind. But equally, it can be like, we can underestimate what this friendship with God can look like. We can just turn it into a dry set of things we do, an activist, this is what we do with God in the world, but nothing of what is available in terms of encounter and intimacy and, and, and closeness with God. Jesus has opened up a better way where we can come into the presence of God and experience God our Father as friend. And so theologically, Jesus has brought about a new agreement. The old agreement has passed away and the new agreement of opening up our way to God is entirely based on what Jesus has done. It's through trust and this word of faith that we've been talking about over the last number of weeks. Trust in Jesus is about that which connects us uh, with God and, and allows us to come into his presence through his love and his forgiveness that invites us to come on the basis of grace. That's what it means theologically, but practically, what does this living out this friendship, this connection, look like? I want to borrow a phrase from Celtic spirituality. Um, the Celtic spirituality often talk about a, a thin place. A thin place, a really good example one is Iona Abbey, that place just off the west coast of Scotland near the Isle of Mull, which St Columba um, was all around and they tried to create this little sense of a heavenly Jerusalem on earth as an example of what it looks like when heaven and earth collide. A thin place is a meeting place, a physical meeting place where heaven and earth are particularly close and intimate and profound and real in experience together. Um, I love the idea, I, I, I love the concept, the, the way it kind of breaks down dualisms that heaven's over here and earth's here and then disconnected and just shatters that idea and shows this dynamic interaction where heaven and God's presence interacts in powerful, tangible ways. Of course, if you push that concept, the concept you can't find, a thin place is not in the Bible. If you push it too far, it's problematic that there, God only meets in physical spaces or, or indeed the, the idea that thin places, because they tend to conjure up like remote, quiet, monastic things. Um, Surely God is not just bound by these quiet times because our lives are spent so much on the go. A thin place cannot be reduced to that. But of course, the mystery that we're invited into in the church is to realise, actually, we are the people who, who go by his name, who claim to be beyond that curtain, cling into Jesus. And as our other writers in the New Testament say, we become the temple of the living God, the, the, the presence of of God's Spirit is one that is powerful and personal and experienced among us. And what an incredible reminder that we, particularly as we can't do this now, as the gathered people though, are people who should be expecting to be a thin place, a place where heaven and earth collide, a place where God's Spirit works powerfully among us, sometimes in obvious ways, but always uh, drawing us into our, our relationship with our God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. But equally, it should remind us that actually, as a thin, we're meant to be a thin place, a place of encounter, as we scatter and as we go as his people, as we are his servants in the world. How else are people going to know? How, and, it's not, and of course, but that can sound ridiculous if we go thinking everybody needs our help and everybody needs what we know. That can sound arrogant. But when it, as we go as sort of scattered servants in the world to, to delivery men, encountering checkout people or encountering our staff or neighbours, however we go, if we go with that humility that just wants to express something of God's heart, well, well people who are called by that name will, will in some mysterious way carry the presence of God 
into all sorts of places. God showing up in all sorts of places, be it at watching the football or being at watching um, the kids or being in work or meetings or right when it's all kicking off. These are the places that we go as his scattered servants where we can know the presence of God as we go, the kingdom of God breaking in. And we are the ones who should be inviting other people into this place, this place behind the curtain. Apparently one in four people, I, I don't know all about the statistics, but I don't know about the people, the one in four maybe you are not turned into prayer. But if there is a hunger in this moment, then surely we need to be saying, God, send us. Send us as your servants who carry imperfectly your presence, this treasure in jars of clay. And might we, as we sit, this is the moment in church calendar between Ascension and Pentecost, which is next week. As we look again to the risen Christ, who is seated above, who will send his spirit, might we long for more of his presence in our lives as we gather together in the future. Might we long for more of his presence in our lives. May our marriages, our homes, our relationships with one another, may they become thinner places again. Might we dare to even believe that we can encounter God out with these walls, that we can encounter him on the go, meeting the people we meet every day. And may we carry his presence with us. As we sit or as we stand in these places, in these walls, may we pray, let your kingdom come this day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have opened up your presence, your powerful, your personal presence through Jesus. Thank you that there's no wall we need to climb up and get over, but that you have descended down and come to us and shown us love. May we know something of a deeper encounter with you. May we experience you as our friend. And may those of us who, who, who suffer with mental ill health for this week where we've been thinking about that, may we know your peace, your security. May we know you as an anchor in this turbulent time. And as we look to Pentecost, God, would you stir up just that passion that makes us longers or seekers or pursuers of the God who has come down. Lord, let your kingdom come, we pray this day. Amen. Forgive. Here 
sanctified by glory and fire. And now I found the greatest love of all is mine since you laid down your life, the greatest sacrifice. found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your hand. You sing majesty, majesty, forever I am changed by your has found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your hand. We sing majesty, majesty, forever I am changed by your In the presence of your majesty Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my 
so much for joining us. If you have any questions or if we can help in any way, please do get in touch. Just send an email to church at apbc.net. We've had an Alpha course start this past week, so please do be keeping that in your prayers. But we also have another Alpha course starting alongside that very soon. So if you have anyone in mind who you'd like to invite to that and bring them along, then you can sign up online. Or if you'd like to help lead and facilitate that, then please send Stephen an email, just stephen at apbc.net. As we go into the rest of this day and this week, may the words of this song remind you of the comfort and goodness of our God, the Good Shepherd, who leads us in his ways. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not one he makes me lie in pastures green he leads me by the still still waters his goodness restores my soul and i will trust in you I will try.